Hello everybody, welcome to our uh, presentation. I'm, uh, my name is JP. I'm Omar. I hope you guys also got a, a handout if there, there's some floating around. So, uh, so what is Lumen, uh, before I can describe what Lumen Display is, here are some just examples of, of where large installation LEDs are used and also uh, large light displays as well. So we have our famous New York Times Square where vivid images and advertising is also displayed 24-7 365 days a year. We have our common traffic signs where you see on um, your freeways, busy freeways, as well as neon signs. So, however, all these have issues. So the cost of these displays are pretty expensive. So they range, they can range from thousands to even millions of dollars per installation. So such as your giant jumbotron in the AT&T uh, stadium, that's around uh, $2 million for installation. They also lack scalability. So if you want to scale your display or upgrade it, it also costs quite a bit of money to do that. So if you, it's also re is related with viewing distance. So if you want to have a higher, a larger viewing distance, like you can see the display further back, it's gonna, you're gonna have to make the display bigger, which adds to cost. Another thing is that the displays are pretty static, most of them. So if you saw on that, tra on that street sign, this is only a, a single color red, as well as the neon sign. They're only capable of what the gas inside the neon sign and the glass is, uh, was inserted in. So those are, that's another limiting factor on how much content can be displayed. So color is a very important thing. So our project goal with Lumen Display was we wanted to make it readily available for everyone. So that means we had to get the cost low enough so anyone can buy it and use our product. We also wanted to make it scalable. So if someone wanted to already had an existing LED uh, installation, they could add more and more displays, so stack them together. We also made our product open source, so full open source hardware and clean code, so you can take a look at the design files and help improve upon the design, as well as write commercial and consumer applications. So here are some just basic use cases where we're using Luminate Display right now. So right now, we're, you can use in restaurants, you can update your um, daily specials and menus just with the, using your computer. You can make cool, vivid images and advertising to show like, this is us, we, have, we, we want to offer you a really good service or product. So you can also use as scoreboards. So scoreboards are used like in college stadiums, high school. So expanding market is high schools. Scoreboards run for thousands of dollars. And then another issue is they're, they're fixed. So you have your, your banner and logo just stuck in paint. You can't actually uh, uh, make it versatile for any sport. So if you have one for baseball, it stays for baseball. We, uh, this display can be moved for any sport or any, any, any venue. Uh, you can also use it for entertainment. So displaying cool video um, visualizations. Also with uh, studio lighting, so if you're doing like photo shoots, this display is capable of putting out enough light that you can illuminate the whole entire room. So here's our outline for our project. So we're first gonna be talking about how Lumit Display was, um, how we came from theoretical and from proof of concept into an actual working product that you see in front. And then from there, we're gonna talk about the applications and as well as follow with a live demo. So the heart of this project is the RGB LED, the most important part. It's also uh, it's a surface mount chip that's five by five millimeters in size. So I'll just pass some of these LEDs around. So these are really pretty small. So you guys want to pass them around. They're pretty small, so don't eat them. One thing to note. They include an IC inside. This IC controls all the color parameters, all every single color parameter as well as the control. It makes it really, really easy to control. So as I said, color is really important, so it can produce up to around 17 million different possible color combinations. So the LEDs I'm passing around, capable of doing that, just like your, like some of the high-end LCD monitors, they're capable of doing that. So here's just the uh, RGB character parameters. So that's, this is the chip doing all the voltage control right here, so three, all the way from two volts to uh, 4 point, 4 point, 3.4 volts, so that's from a five volt input. So um, it, this LED consumes 60 milliamps, so that's 20 milliamps per channel. So right, right now, Omar just turned up the display and just telling you how bright each individual pixel is. So we have over over uh, over a thousand pixels, and these are only being three being illuminated right there. So very very bright. It's also the design of the chip allows you to uh, daisy chain these really really easily. All you have to do is connect data in and data out to each other. So you put them in series and you connect the LEDs in parallel with each other. So they receive five volt power, every single LED, and then you just uh, put the data in series. Another important thing to note is the, is the uh, decoupling capacitors, 0.1 microfarad. That allows the LED, uh, to, that prevents the LED from resetting when, it's sending a new, when you're sending a new control signal in. So now Omar is gonna be talking about the LED control. 
So in order to control the LEDs, we need to send bits. And each bit is a 1.25 microseconds. And to distinguish between a, a low bit and a high bit, it's a different vo high voltage of 0.35 second, microseconds or 0.9 microseconds. So this is how we can uh, set the bits of data to control the colors. Also, if you want to send a different color uh, for each LED, you need to send a reset um, code first in order to have the, the different color show up. So in the next slide, as you can see here, for each LED, we have the green, red, blue, and the data is transmitted first, the most significant bit, which are these green ones. So these are first, and then these are last. And so each of them has eight bits for uh, each separate color, green, red, blue. So in order to, to send this data uh, for the, sorry, to create a green color, we would send uh, full high bits for the green one, and for the rest ones, we would send zero bits. And another example, purple one, it's a, a mixture of red and blue. So we'd send a zero bit for the green one and once for the rest. So our system diagram here, we have the basic system diagram. In order to control those bits, we need something that works fast and a microcontroller that can control all these strips at once. And we need something really fast as uh, we need to send 24 bits per each LED and we have 1920 LEDs, so that's quite a bit of data. So initially, the microcontroller we chose was a Arduino Uno, just because we were familiar with it. That's what we chose. So as you can tell here, it has a, a pretty low memory, 32 kilobytes, and 16 megahertz of processing speed, but it does not have any direct memory access. And then as we progress to our, in, our, in our project, we discovered a, a different microcontroller, which is a the Teensy. As you can tell here, it's much faster processing speed, which is needed if you want to run videos or complex images. It also has a more, more memory and RAM. And finally, it has direct memory access, a very important thing for us, since we can access the memory directly and while well, the controller is readying up for the next, uh, next, uh, the next screen, or uh, what we want to show here, uh, it's already uploading one at the same time. It's, it's getting ready for the next one. So it's kind of doing simultaneously, uh, as opposed to the Arduino, which does like, reads one, one screen and then uploads it and then does the next one. So it's much faster. So our obvious choice was uh, the Teensy. As, as, you, as the Teensy are being passed around, you can see that about four of them fit in the same footprint that, that can fit into an Arduino. So that's another uh, design implementation as we didn't want to take a lot of space here. You can tell here this one teensy, and this is another one. So it's much smaller than the Uno. So to control the teensies in order to send the data to the LEDs, we chose the Octa WS 2811 library. This library supports simultaneous update to eight different LED strips at once. So that's why we needed the different pulse width modulation pins that this board has. It's also DMA based, so it can handle the the fast speeds to refresh the, the next uh, frame. So for the initial setup, we run the we run it in Arduino, in the Arduino IDE. It's a one-time thing, so it sets up the different parameters. For this one, as you can see, there's two TNTs, so one needs to be set up for the top, another one needs to be set up for the bottom. So this is how we set it up, but it does not run any LEDs. It's just initial setup, a one-time thing, unless you want to up, upgrade your, your LED uh, LED display and add more and different uh, or change uh, how many cases you want to run at once. <laughs> to run the LEDs, we use proce processing. It's a Java-based programming language, and this is what actually runs the LEDs. It runs the the uh, basically runs the show. So you can see the videos, images, uh, whatever you want to show. It's also multi-platform, basically any OS, so it's pretty diverse. So the last thing we need uh, to control the LEDs is, or to run the LEDs is power. So power is a very, very critical part. So right here we have a, another spare unit, power supply, I won't pass this on, it's pretty heavy, pretty bulky, but it's capable of driving almost 2,000 LEDs for our system. So it's outputting about a five volts, 120 amps, so that's 600 watts. However, our system doesn't actually run that, it consumes that much power, it consumes an average 
of 100 watts. So we measure it using a power meter that you plug in a wall and it tells you how much it current reads and, power, and how much power it draws. That includes the cooling fans on the back. So it's running about 100 watts. Another unique thing about this power supply is the wide input voltage and the type. So you can put AC or DC into your system. So it's compatible compatibility is across the board. Another thing, another important note is the MTB F life mean time between failure is actually very, very high. So around 150,000 hours. So this is actually three times longer than the LEDs are rated. So we designed a system to be run for many days, many years, as long as you want to run. You're gonna actually probably be replacing your LED board before you replace the power supply. So with anything, power you want to have clean power and quality power. So this is our proof of concept. Before we, uh, so we combined, so we took our knowledge of how to control the LEDs and how to power them, and we decided to put them all on a breadboard. So, yeah. So this is our breadboard up here. Same, same exact model. We just use it to test for if we can even control the LEDs. So from there, we actually went to a smaller scale uh, flex PCB board. And, up and use a different type of LED, so the current one, the WS2812Bs, instead of 2812s, instead because it allows for reverse flex, allows, it prevents um, po reverse polarity as well as higher brightness. Also, the pin readout was a lot sim uh, simpler. So the WS2812 has six pins, while the 2812Bs have four. So it makes it a lot easier to route your PCB board and come up with your final design. We also increased the resolution, so we had to switch to the TC board because the Uno has not enough memory. So from there, we took all our, all our proof of concept and put it in a PCB board. So we had it increased the resolution furthermore, and then we developed, uh, that's how we developed uh, this first part of the uh, PCB right there. So, and we, add, we added cooling because it's, required, it's drawing so much power it's capable of, so we want the thing to run cool. But uh, for running 100 watts, you don't really need to cool that much. We also uh, use a new LED layout, so this is the LED layout. So this is critical to how, how we actually connect it to your TC board. So from here, we, the data is, is actually in series, as I mentioned, in the application circuit. And then it's zigzagged right there on the, at, the, at the end. So it, so odd connects to even rows and then it repeats itself down the chain. So this allows multiple strands of LEDs, LEDs to be connected, but it doesn't use as much LEDs all across per, per pin because it would actually waste memory. So it's actually paralleling the, uh, paralyzing the, how the LEDs are driven. So between the data is, uh, is power, you route five volt power, and then after that you want to fill it with ground. So for our first, for our prototype, we use um, ground buses because we want to isolate every row of LEDs. So we're using the LED strip model, which would, 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 would prevent if one of the LEDs blew out or died, it wouldn't affect the whole entire array. So we thought that was good from a design standpoint. So this is how, this is our actually our final system diagram right here. So we have as Omar was explaining how to set up the TCs in Arduino. So the top TC drives the top part and the bottom TC drives the bottom part of the display. So it's parallel, paralleling the data, parallelizing the data through the entire board. So this allows for higher refresh rates than if you're using one TC board. Uh, so this is your computer, it's running all the programming and just sending out to the, to the board. So however, we did, we did our first prototype, it didn't work. Uh, we spent about a month debugging it and figuring out why it didn't work. So we came up with these conclusions. So the LED spacing was too close together. So that if you have components too close together, you're gonna end up bridging them together. So that can cause um, component failure and also affect the rest of the board. Another thing was that we didn't have input uh, filter ca caps. So when you first plug in the 600 watt power slot, a huge rush of current can come in and damage the ICs. So that's another possibility. The last thing which I think, which actually caused me to do a whole redesign of the board was how the LEDs were isolated. So as Omar mentioned during how the LEDs are controlled with the timing signals, the isolation of the LEDs, I believe, caused the LEDs just to stay at a logic zero, so just permanently off, even though the LEDs were receiving five volts all across. So from there, we uh, I tested the fixes on a smaller prototype board that Omar is showing, so I'll pass this one around. So this is using uh, similar, uh, exact same layout as this big board right here. It's just this big board is scaled up. So we added a fil filtering input cap, so when you first turn on, you don't see the LEDs actually flicker or turn on right away when, you, when the power is turned on. Uh, we also increased the LED spacing just by a little bit more um, to prevent any bridging or shorting. So this is just the final layer of the PCB board. So uh, it, the PCB board is around 22 by 10 inches, so it's very, very big. 
And we also redid the ground planes as well as got rid of the ground vias. So the vias are represented by the little green dots right here. So there used to be a ground via right there, but we got rid of it by using ground planes. So this helps with uh, reduced time on routing as well as reduced board noise. So this is how five volts route across. So as you saw the ground, uh, the power board that's in front of Omar, can you hold that up please? Yeah, we were able to eliminate that, so reduce costs even further by integrating that part in the board. So we only went, we went down from 35 wires down to four wires. We also kept uh, power to the Teensies on its own separate independent power supply, which allows you to disconnect the Teensies um, without, or program the Teensies without actually power on the LEDs. This is important because several times we actually wrote bad code and it sent the LEDs on full brightness, and you know, it can be pretty blinding. So from there, uh, this is just the view of the ground planes, and this is how we did the improvement in the routing of the Teensy boards. So this is just the same thing as the matrix design. So this is our final product, as you see in front. So since we came up with uh, an interesting product, we decided, you know, what applications can we use this for? So we said, you know, it has a lot of colors and it could display images. Why not use it for uh, visual testing and such things? So some tests we thought of was a uh, visual acuity uh, using the selling chart and Ishihara test uh, using these uh, color plates somehow simulate that on the board or glaucoma testing, which needs uh, light to see how the eye can see well. Unfortunately, some challenges we came up with this when we met with Dr. Murray uh, recently, he said uh, it's too much of too low of a resolution for the eye chart and it has too many colors or it can be too bright and distract uh, to get a correct result for some vision tests. And also, brightness may be harmful for people that want to use it, uh, especially since we thought we could use it for uh, helping visually impaired children. He said, well, if it's too bright, it might be damaging to their eyes. Uh, we want to, since we have uh, RGB, we want to be able to uh, simulate this test uh, by setting uh, one side uh, yellow and the other side, the patient would uh, choose what color they think matches with it, and this would tell us if uh, that person is impaired with either red or green color. So it's a green, green red color deficiency test. Another test is uh, the fourth four dot test, which basically two green dots, a red one, and uh, a standard uh, white one. And this tests how someone can use their colors. Do they work together or do they not work together? So that's something we can simulate with this. Now we'll go with the live demo. All right, so as you can see here, uh, this, is, uh, this is testing for a green deficiency, or it, it's a simulation for what would be done. Uh, this one's the standard uh, yellow on the other side. The, you might think it's changing green, but it's not. It's the red color that's actually changing. It's the same uh, 256 uh, decimal color for the green one, and the red one is uh, uh, decreasing. This is uh, the basics of the test. This is just another test with the testing for red. Uh, the green, color. green deficiency. Green deficiency. Mm -hmm. So this is just purely a simulation. We want to eventually allow the user to uh, to input their uh, uh, be able to adjust the colors themselves. And this um, is so also the four four dot test. Yeah. So uh, a patient would see this uh, with uh, you know the kind of the 3D glasses that you'd use for those old movies. So it'll be like one side will be green and the other uh, eye would see the red one, and this can tell them if your eyes are functioning uh, together or not. So unfortunately, we're running close on time. So so we wanted to, uh, so in conclusion, with our project, we wanted to simplify the design of our display as well as make it cost effective and affordable for many applications, including healthcare. So the RGB anomaly scope machine is very, very expensive. This display costs significantly less, as well as when you produce more of these displays, the cost will drive down even further. We also have a uh, processing work with any OS, so you can run this from your laptop, even your, t even your mobile device. We, it's also another important thing is you can run any, many applications and you can also um, purpose this display that will be fun to use for, for any intent application audience.
So our future goal is we even want to, we want to reduce the cost even further. So our current display costs around eighteen hundred dollars, but if we we have a second one being made right now that's going around like sixteen hundred dollars. From there, the price will drop down a little bit more. We want to if we had a computer engineer, we could also make a graphical user interface instead of just running lines of code, and we could actually have a make it easier to control the board even more, and also uh, integrate mobile device connectivity. So we also want to thank our sponsors, so uh, Royal Circus for helping with the PCB fab. Um, also PC assembly, so there's Liz in the back right there from Beam Electronics that helped me a lot with getting the board assembled. Um, IEEE for initial funding and AccuFocus and Acro uh, for, uh, with some of the early vision testing as well as Acrobotic Industries helping with some of the CAD stuff design. And these are also, we also want to thank the uh, students and people and faculty who helps with our project as well. So now we'll open the board up to questions. Uh, comparing this to commercial products that are available, how does this compare and what's the differentiation between what you're doing, what you go out and buy, let's say, uh, in for, the cost differences? For the RGB test, that machine along cost, cost upwards of uh, 2000 and this uh, this is only about 1400 Let's and the, the RGB and normal scope is only a single testing, so it's only for that RGB test, and ours would be able to do uh, that test and additional at, at a reduced cost. Do you see also this concept to scale up to be huge? Correct. I mean, it, I guess yes. It's, it's so we, you can if, imagine. if we had our second display in, we, I actually would have shown you how easy it is to stash this up. So on the next revision, we're actually going to eliminate these mounting bolts right here and then and you put them, figure out a way how to mount the board behind it with the screws and stuff. And you can just stack them like cell displays. So you can just make a giant video wall. So as I mentioned about how the teensy, multiple TNC boards can be connected, you just attach one pin to it, configure all of it in Arduino, and then you run your processing program. And you have your video wall. You can build up a video wall in less than an hour. So you can stack in two dimensions? Right? Correct, you can do four dimensions, five dimensions. Yes, sir. So, so let's say uh, I'm a customer and I, do, I have a stadium and I need large displays. Um, this versus uh, what's out there in the industry right now, um, is there a, do you see a significant cost advantage to your product, you know, by a one foot by one foot, you know, type cost per square foot? Well, this is over a square foot. Right, 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 right. Uh, the same unit, you know, compare, you know, one, one foot of uh, what's out there right now, what's one foot of your product? Is there an advantage of, um, you know, of cost? Do you envision that? Do you see that as a possibility? Uh, possibly, yes. Uh, it's, uh, so with our display, each unit can, it costs uh, sub two thousand dollars, while those ones cost millions of dollars. So the giant jumbotron, and I think in AT and T, and some recent, I think there's a jumbotron coming up in the Levy Levy Stadium, which is over a million dollars. So if you were just to measure out the square footage for that versus this, you have multiple of these ones. These, this would actually be a lot cheaper for that, and you're getting pretty much the same exact uh, resolution right, right. for that. So, uh, how does it compare with the uh, uh, like in the terms of power? Will it uh, compare to the existing solution? Um, do you have any plans? Like, you sure it like, how do you reduce the, the next power? Two? Yeah. Oh, yeah. you optimize for power. Yeah, well, that's, it's kind of one a, a disadvantage of running so many LEDs. When you're running lots of anything, it's going to be consuming lots of power. But with this display, you're not going to be um, consuming. So how do you address that problem? Have you thought that? Uh, we're trying to we're trying to work on that right now. Yeah. Uh, it, we'd have to actually change the LEDs that themselves to reduce the amount of power. So from 60 milliamps go down maybe to like 20 milliamps, but I'll put the same amount of brightness. But as I said, uh, it's only running like 100 watts because if uh, you're running this display at full power, it'd be way too bright. Um, you'll see in the in the engineering quad later. I can power on full brightness, and you can see how it can limit the whole entire quad with that. But we do that. We don't do that here because of, for safety reasons. Right. <laughs> you mentioned the temperature of your board at full power? Yeah, so, oh, no, I didn't mention that, but I will. So our board can reach up to 100, 165 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's under that's just under the safe operating temperature of the LEDs, which is 180 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So the cooling fans on the back help with um, channeling out the hot air. And you can adjust the parameters of the fan to uh, adjust with temperature and how much power is consumed with the LEDs. So it doesn't run too hot. How did you simulate your meet time between failure? That was provided in the day sheet of the past month. Oh, okay. <laughs> and also the day sheet of the LEDs. I went to your website and it, you have a user stock, it looks like some review files and so forth. Mm -hmm. And of course, the next thing is 
oh, where do I buy one? I guess this is a prototype and you've kind of taken it the next step where you're like going to productize this. And this is this is typically the kinds of things you have to have all the support, all the things. So it also saw your version brochure. So that's actually quite interesting. We've thought mm -hmm. through all this. If we were to sell it, uh, I don't know how we would do that. I guess Kickstarter or something? Or just, yeah. I don't know. Well, there's a lot more to it than, yeah, of course. than certainly this is just a project, but mm -hmm. you obviously look at some of these aspects. Correct. Any other questions? So, um, as a follow-up question to the other questions, the cost and power analysis in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. we're looking for some sort of comparison to mark current market because what you seem to be showing here is a different implementation of the same application. And Correct. we want to know where the advantages lie and by how much. Do you have any data or any analysis calculations done in terms of cost and performance? Uh, n not not specifically, but I think we do have a yeah we have a viewing distance slide on like how uh, like how this like how the viewing distance from a regular display is calculated. So like in your living room, your living room is around like eight feet for a pretty large living room. So if you just multiply your screen diameter that uh, this size diagonal size by if you do a formula, you can get what you should be viewing your TV screen at. And this is actually follows up with the projector right here. This projector right here is designed to fit the size of this room. However, with ours, we're using large format pixels, so they're really, really big pixels that I guess I don't know where to pass it around somewhere. But that allows you to view it for, uh, further distance because of the brightness is a lot higher. So that's uh, that's why our I think uh, that's why ours is, has a higher bit, bigger advantage for a smaller. Right. Because you, you mentioned a lot that it's going to be cheaper and it's going to be, you know, there's got to be so many advantages, but it's, um, for us at least, it's hard to see it without any data or numbers, even graphs, just to show us a reference point, you know. Okay. So, but, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right. Your ambient temperature when you measured your board temperature? What was it? What was your ambient when you measured your board temperature? Oh, like when it's off or when it's just running at like this right here? No, what, what was the ambient temperature? Oh, if you're running on like high brightness? When you were measuring your board temperature. Oh, we were running at full brightness on white color, so it reached up to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. But what Fahrenheit. was the surrounding temperature? Oh, it was just average room temperature. Yeah, so uh, some 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And that'll conclude our Q&A section. This is the last presentation of the session. Thank you. So if you have any more questions, uh, come out to the quad and do some more demos. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.